Good to have everybody with us tonight. Glad you could be here. Let me tell you my uh, little story. I, I, I tell you, I've uh, been preaching last couple weeks about talking to people, maybe inviting people to church, you know, it, or just in some way plant a seed with somebody, okay? Uh, sow seed with them. Give them the word of God somehow, some way. Give them a chance. Give them as good a chance as you had at the gospel. As good a chance as you had at the gospel. Okay? And however you got introduced to the gospel. With me, uh, my first introduction was Second Baptist Church riding their church bus. And um, I remember Bob Choate was doing the children's church back then. And um, I remember going down after the service one time. I was young. I didn't really understand. I wanted to see what everybody was doing down there more than anything. It was curiosity. Uh, so I, don't, I couldn't say, yeah, that's when I got saved. But, but at the time, my mom wasn't going. And then uh, not too long after that, a neighbor invited us to attend this church for a big, well, it was the church dedication, building dedication, October 1974. They had most of this building done. None of the downstairs classrooms were there. That, that basement was completely empty. And um, they didn't have the parking lot paved or nothing. And, but they had enough of the building finished where they could start having services. And so that was our first time here and been here practically ever since. But a neighbor invited my mom, specifically. Not me and my, my sister, invited my mom. And I, I guess God was ready to deal with her because God brought her here, God planted her here, and she grew here. I mean, she was in. Every service, she was in. So that's how, that's how it happened with us. <clears throat> um, your story might be different. This is a different age now. You know, we used to send people out on Thursday night knocking every door in town. That's what we did years ago. Some people still do that. I don't know <clears throat> how effective it is. Because, number one, somebody knocks on my door, and I don't know who they are. I'm going to have a gun behind my back. In today's world, that's just about how you have to meet somebody at the door you don't know. <clears throat> so, anyway... We have different ways of reaching out to people, and especially with the investment that we've made in this church to get the Word of God out through the Internet, to use those tools that we have, that everybody in this room has. Using that tool to reach somebody, you know, think about it. You're going to meet somebody from Germany that saw your Facebook post and... God sowed the seed of the word of God in their life, and you're going to meet them in heaven one of these days. And you'll never go to church with them except in heaven. That's the potential. And so, and I believe in that. So um, Sunday after, after the afternoon service, Lisa said, I got to go to Walmart. That's not unusual. So we go. She's in line to get uh, something at the pharmacy. So I'm just kind of standing back. Pull my phone out. And I noticed that there was a uh, Tom Fitton, who runs a law group in Washington, D.C. He's a guy suing Hillary for all those emails. And he's successful, too. He's good. He tweeted out something that really troubled him. And it's this movement called Siege the White House, or the White House Siege. And they're trying to provoke these Antifa types to literally... You know, in chess, you put the pawns out as cannon fodder. You put the little guys out to get shot and killed, and then you attack while they're reloading. And that's the plan. Mark it down, that's the plan. They're going to use these young punks, and the hope was when they went against the White House back during the George, George Floyd protest, they wanted people to get shot by Secret Service. They wanted that. Because then that would give them an excuse 
to try to take control of the government, the White House. And, uh, so, but that didn't work. Maybe Trump knows their playbook. I don't know. But anyway, that didn't happen. And all these riots and stuff like it, why doesn't Trump do something about it, people are saying. D do you really want him to shoot all those people? Because that's what they want. They want him to shoot and kill those people, so they'll have a reason to take over, by force if they have to. So now they're pr promoting all these young punks to go and try to take over the White House. And understand, White House is not the mayor's house of Festus. Okay, you can walk up on the mayor's front yard. If you climb that fence at the White House, they will load you up with bullets and then ask you what you're doing there. That's what they did the other night. Whoever it was that approached the White House and made like they were going to shoot, they shot first, and then they started asking questions. So I was looking at that on my phone. And there was a guy standing here. He was behind Lisa, but he was distant. And he asked me, he said, uh, sir, are you in line? I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm just waiting on my wife. And I said, she's almost done. I said, go ahead. And just right then, I mean, the Holy Ghost drugged me over to that man, and I had my phone out like this, and I said, sir, I don't know who you are, I don't know how you think, but I don't know, take a look at this. And he looked at it, and he went, wow. And I said, that's, that's scary to me. He said, uh, can you send that to me? I said, yeah, how you want it? He said, I'm on Facebook, are you? I said, yep. I said, give me your name. He gave me his name, I said, Give me, I'll send you a friend request and I'll send you this. And he said that he had met a couple other people in Walmart where he shared cons conservative things with them. And I went, he said the C word, <laughs> conservative. And I said, I think you and I kind of think alike. And he said, yeah. He said, I try to witness to people just about everywhere I go. And I went, he said witness. <laughs> so I shared it with him and walked off and I sent him a message and I said, I'm a pastor and a patriot. Didn't hear nothing from him. The next morning, got up, and he said, yeah. He said, I love my KJB Bible. And he said, I try to share it everywhere I go. And I wrote him, I said, you said my favorite three letters in the whole world, KJB. Okay? That, and that was an irresistible nudge from the Holy Ghost. I couldn't have no more stopped that if I wanted to. God wanted me to interact with this man, and it was just as easy and natural. You know, if I would have shared it with him, and he would have been some Biden guy, he would have said, yeah, they ought to throw him out. I'm not sure what I would have said then. I, might have, I probably would have backed off. But God wanted that little interlude to happen. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And I'm telling you, I don't... You know, I'm kind of shy when it comes to that stuff. If I see a guy in a military cap, then I can talk to him a little bit. I got something to say or whatever. But when the Lord's in it, you can't stop it. And there's nothing wrong with asking God to give you a situation where you can, at, you can say something to somebody. Not a thing in the world wrong with that. And if you'll do it, God's already got it set up. Uh, I used to work with a guy and we worked well together. I really liked him. And uh, his name was James. And he, James and I were painting in a house one time years ago. And I'd worked with him for probably a, close to a year. And he knew I was pastor. And I was pastoring Richwoods back then. And, he, um, and God, we were in the same room together. And God started telling me, Mike, talk to him. Mike, talk, you're going to talk to him about Jesus. And I said, sure, Lord. I'm rolling paint. And God said, now. I mean, and I went, um, James, you thought about coming to church with me? And he stopped and he said, you know, I'm just standing here thinking, maybe I need to start looking into getting back with God. Easiest conversation I ever had at work, okay? God knew what he had worked. It's like Peter and Cornelius. You go read Acts chapter 10. Peter, God, God moved in Peter's life. God moved in Cornelius' life. 
and brought them together, and it was nothing. Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. God, worked, God had prepared the Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading scripture, saying, God, I don't understand this. I need someone to teach me. Boom, Philip shows up. It's on the side of the road, hitchhiking. And there it is right there. I'm telling you, that's two witnesses. God will do it. He'll make it so easy for you. So easy. And I took, when I was in college, I took a mandatory course. It was D. James Kennedy's um, course on witnessing. Cold turkey, just walking up to somebody and starting a conversation about the Lord and trying to go through the plan of salvation with them on the street, at McDonald's, anywhere. Took a whole course on it. And they sent us out to do it. And I stunk at that because it was mechanical, it was robotic. I didn't have all the stuff memorized. You don't have to. When God puts it in you, you go. He gives you the words to say, amen? All right, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll start fasting for an hour, all right? Or feasting for an hour, then you'll fast. Father, we love you and we have a lot of things, Lord, to be thankful for. And I pray, Lord, you bless the man that I met Sunday, pray, Lord, you'd bless what he's doing, and I thank you, Lord. Um, I have no doubt, God, that he's my brother, and I pray, dear God, you would use him for your kingdom mightily, and thank you, Lord, for letting me talk to him, and Lord, I hope that uh, I can be a blessing to him the way he was to me, and Father, I pray, Lord, for these people, all of these people. Uh, Lord, that you would convince them that your way is always best. And God, you can put them in situations and you will put them in situations where it would be the easiest thing in the world to talk about the Lord. Father, people will just come and ask us out of the blue. They'll just walk up to us and say, I don't know why I'm talking to you, but I need help. God, I believe that you do stuff like that all the time. And you've done it in the word. And I know that's how you work. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless these people and bless me and help us, dear God, to always be looking for an opportunity, to always be willing to wait on the opportunity and not try to force anything, but, Father, to be the Bible for people who need the Bible today. Father, we pray for our country. We pray for our church tonight and all of those, Lord, who are watching with us online. We pray, dear God, that you'd bless this teaching. We love you and we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. So we're studying fasting and prayer, prayer and fasting. We mentioned um, the two situations last Wednesday night, the two verses, Matthew 17, 21, how, by, how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Mark 9, 29, he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. We looked at both of those passages and how they dealt with devils that had to obey Jesus, but they wouldn't necessarily listen to you, even though one of these days you're going to stand in judgment over them. We are going to be given the authority after the resurrection to judge angels. Okay, But some of these things are stubborn. Some of them are, uh, they are stronger than us. They have greater might, greater power, greater authority. Jesus can command them easily. We can't. And he says to us, both places, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So we're just looking at fasting in general. Isaiah 58, 5 through 7 was the primary purpose for fasting, but we'll see some others as we move along. And so last Wednesday, we got to the point, and I read some of these, but the question is, how long to fast? Does the Bible give examples? Yes. Does the Bible ever give commandments on how long to fast? And to my knowledge, the answer is no. I've not found a situation where God said, if you want the, even when he said, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting, he didn't say how long. He didn't say, okay, this, this devil takes three days. These over here take one day. These over here, 40 days. He did not say that. He just said prayer and fasting. And so we have examples given to us in the scripture. How long? We, again, we know that Jesus uh, was tempted and fasted 40 days in the wilderness. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And uh, the, I'll throw this in. How did he defeat the devil? 
Number one, the Word of God. He quoted Scripture to him. He didn't get into some big argument. He, does, he wasn't trying to change the devil's mind. He wasn't trying to win the devil's soul. He wasn't, he wasn't anything. He just said, here's the Scripture. Now get out. We know that at Acts chapter 10, I referenced that earlier. Cornelius had been fasting for four days. Why was Cornelius fasting? Now Cornelius had, knew about God. And he wanted salvation. He wanted God in his life. But I'm, I don't think he had heard about Jesus yet. Well, somebody asked me this question, just as a little side note, about Romans 1 and what about people who have never heard the gospel all their life. They live in the, in the jungle and they've never even seen a radio. They don't even know what an airplane is. Nothing like that. They live their life. Does, is God going to hold them accountable? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely he will. There's something that God puts in every human being that's born. Number one, his book in their DNA, in their genetics. The law is in them. It's, it's written in them. The Bible says that. And that which may be known of God can be seen in the creation. Uh, Paul said that in Romans chapter 1. And I said this. I believe that if there's anybody, let's say somebody that did grow up in the Congo in Africa or the Brazilian rainforest or whatever, if they looked up at the stars and said, I want to know who made those stars, I think God's going to show up and send the gospel to them. That to me is Cornelius. Cornelius wants to know it's in his heart. God knew it. God responded by sending Peter over there to him. First Gentile to ever be saved. Okay? Uh, but he fasted four days. Acts 27, 33. Uh, this day is the 14th day that you have tarried and continued fasting. So, and have taken nothing. So they uh, had been, uh, Paul was talking about them. They had been fasting for 14 days. That's a long time to fast. 1 Samuel 31, 13. They took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted Seven days. We know there's seven, seven days of feasting in the Bible. The, the, um, the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread was seven days. I think the Feast of um, the Trumpets was seven days and so on. Uh, but here we have a fast that lasts seven days. Did they take water? It's possible. We're not told. We just know that they refrained from bread or any kind of food, substance food. For, for seven days. Uh, turn now, turn to Jeremiah 36, because I know we didn't get this far in it. Jeremiah 36. Here he mentions, and it's very simple, and we have two witnesses on this, a, a single day of fasting. Now some would say, brother, that's about as far as I can go. I understand that, believe me. Uh, years ago when we had a daycare here and they fixed meals for all the kids, we had one lady that mixed, made, and I love meatloaf. And I decided I was going to fast and pray one day and it was meatloaf and gravy day. Meatloaf, mashed potatoes. Oh. And I sat up here. I couldn't take it no more. I went, God, I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. But I understand that. Does just fasting a single day, can it have results? Absolutely. Jeremiah 36, 6. Therefore go thou and read in the roll, which thou hast written from my mouth, the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that came out of their cities. Um, you know, turn over very quickly to the book of Jonah. I just have it in my mind to go there. Um, we know that when Jonah finally, Joel, Amos, Jonah. No, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. We know that when Jonah finally went to Nineveh, he preached there and the king of Nineveh was so moved and in fear that Jonah wasn't lying, that God was going to destroy Nineveh. Um, he called... Verse 5 of uh, Jonah chapter 3, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. 
For a word came unto them, uh, the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid out his robe from him, covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Even the king did that. Well, I'd like to see Nancy Pelosi covered in ashes. <laughs> I don't know if that came out how, it wanted it, how I wanted it, but I'm pretty sure it did. Okay? <laughs> um, he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? Turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. And God saw the works that they turned away from their evil. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. So we don't, we don't really give a, have a record here of how long they fasted. But I would say a, probably a day, at least a day, that they fasted and prayed. Now, I, there's another story in the Bible where the king forbade any of his people from eating. But it wasn't a good idea. The king of Nineveh believes Jonah. And he believes that God is going to destroy the whole city for their wickedness. And it scares him. Listen, preaching on hell and God's wrath has its use, doesn't it? You can't lead that out of the salvation equation when it comes to leading people to Jesus. You got, they have got to be confronted with the wrath of God to be saved. So the king calls for this fast and he said, I want the animals to fast. Cover the animals in sackcloth and ashes. The whole city, rich people, poor people, I'm going to do it. We're going to fast and we're going to pray. Maybe God will repent of wanting to destroy us. And God did. Then you have Saul. Saul had already sort of either started on his road of rejecting God or had already rejected God. And remember, uh, Saul was trying to fight a battle and his people that were fighting with him, they were starving to death. And Saul said, if I catch anybody eating, I'm going to kill them. Okay? And that further weakened the people. And it was a, not a good idea. Saul wasn't doing that out of honor and praise to God. He was doing that because he wanted done what he wanted done. I think he's trying to chase down David. And you remember it was Jonathan, his own son, that was starving to death. Had not heard what his dad said. Dipped his uh, staff and found some honeycomb and dipped it in, and ate the honey in the comb and instantly his eyes were light and now he's ready to go. His people should have been fed. That was the day they should have ate. Amen. It's foolish of Saul to do that. But the king of Nineveh, he knew what to do. Nehemiah chapter 9, turn back there. Nehemiah, that's before Psalms. Go back, Job, Esther, Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah and Ezra and Nehemiah sort of go together. They're about the Jews coming back from Babylonian captivity. And they, there's a lot of things to deal with. They have a lot. God's got a lot of work to do in them. Some of those people were born in Babylon and they did not know their homeland. They hadn't heard the word of God preached there for 70 years. They come back. Now there is a restoration. Some of the old folk knew what the temple looked like. They knew the law of God. The younger folk didn't, so they got to come back. And there's a lot of things they got to do. A lot of the people, in spite of the fact that God had told them not to take wives of the heathen around them, they did that anyway. And believe it or not, it was in their heart to put away those wives and their children because they were not Jews. Now, God's not a racist. But God was going to keep the house of Israel pure. Okay? We know he's doing it for Christ, but he's keeping the house of Israel pure. So they had to put away their wives. But anyway, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1. Now on the 20 and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. So the 20 and 4th day of the month, it seems to me like it was a one-day fast. So we have Jeremiah 36, 6. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1, they set aside a day of fasting and prayer. And remember, if you're going to fast because it's healthy for your body, go right on ahead. If you're going to refrain from food, maybe to get your 
cholesterol down, blood sugar down, your weight down, whatever, your whatever, by all means do it. But that's not necessarily going to invoke God to do something on your behalf. If you're going to spend a day or two fasting and praying, then put everything else aside. Nothing but that. 2 Samuel chapter 1. Um, go back there. Verse 12. They mourned and wept and fasted until even. What does even mean? The evening, the night. So here, they fasted from sun up till sundown, okay, which is a good formula if you can do that. If you can go 24 hours, go 24 hours. Um, but that's what they did. They did that for the benefit of Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. The people had lost their king. They had lost the king's son. Sort of a state of limbo now exists. They're not sure of their future. So out of respect for Saul the king, they're going to fast. But out of seeking the Lord about what's going to happen in the future, they decided to fast until the sun went down. Judges chapter 20, verse 26. Uh, the Bible says, Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God. And again, I'm going to say this. We're here every day, Monday through Friday. Um, and if you tell me, Pastor, got some things I'm going to pray about, things I need. And I know me, if, if I stay at home, it'll be one thing after another. I'll be thinking of things I need to do or the people will be calling all day or whatever. Pastor, can I come to the church and fast and pray? You name the day. Okay, this is your house. This is your church. This is, I believe, the house of the Lord. We set this building aside for the use. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Okay, there are no TVs in here. There's no coffee pots in here. There's nothing, okay, except hymn books, Bibles, and some altars, okay? And I totally recommend, if you ever decide or God ever leads you in your life to spend a day of prayer and fasting, you're more than welcome to do it here, okay? Uh, those of you who can't be here, find a place. Go out in the woods somewhere, okay? Go someplace where hardly nobody goes. Get out away from everybody. Turn your cell phone off. Things like that. Tell somebody where you're going so you're safe. But get away from everything and spend some time with God. I've gone down in the woods before just to visit with God. You're away from everything down there. I've done it here. But that's what I recommend. Uh, so all the children of Israel and all the people went up and they came to the house of the Lord and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even. Again, from sun up to sundown, they did not partake of any food, any bread, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings uh, before the Lord. And I would say this, again, if you're fasting alone, or sometimes maybe people want to fast together and pray together, I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think God does either. There was corporate fastings. It's not a time for joviality. It's not a time for levity. It's not a time for, hey, I heard this joke. This is a good joke the other day. This is a serious, solemn, sober time. It's not a time for... You know, getting along, cutting up with people. It is a time for you to spend with God. For God to spend with you. It's a time of personal sacrifice. So they did it for a day up until evening at the house of the Lord in Judges. 
Nehemiah chapter 9. I think I already read that. That's twice there. But let me... Oh, okay, I know why this is here. Turn it back to Nehemiah chapter 9. Now we're going to look at what they did in Nehemiah. They spent a day fasting, but there were things that they did throughout that day that you can't do while you're at work. You can't do while you're watching the grandkids. You can't do while you've got company over. You can't do while you're at Walmart shopping. You can't do. In most other settings, there has to be a time and a location where you set, every, you set the world aside. The world stops that day. Nobody else matters. This is time you are spending with God. And don't be surprised when the devil shows up and tries to hound you to death with everything. This is why I'm recommending get away where nobody can get to you. So back in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 1, now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloths and earth upon them. And notice what it says, and the seed of Israel separated themselves. Number one, separation. That's what I said, separation. Again, you don't go to work to fast and pray. You don't go to the store to fast and pray. You don't go to your, it's not a family reunion you go to fast and pray at. None of that stuff. You separate yourself and stood. First thing on your day of prayer and fasting, confess your sins. Every one of them. Don't hold back. Don't pretend that well, God, surely he got, that was a long time ago. God got over that. God didn't, doesn't get over anything. If, it's, if they got murder charges against you, there's no statute of limitations on that. That's a lifetime thing. And if you've got charges against you in God's court, those don't go away. God doesn't get over it. Okay? Confess those sins. Bring up stuff that you've already asked God for forgiveness for. Bring it up again. And say, God, I know you probably forgave me of this. In fact, I know you did. But God, I still go back to that. And God, I should have never done that. I should have never been in that situation. I should have never been with this person. I should have never been part of this. I should have never said that. should have never done that, seen that, listened to that, ate that, drank that. God, just, I should have never done that. And God, I'll, I will apologize nearly every day for the rest of my life for that. I don't have a problem with that. I do that. Um, has God already forgiven me? Yeah. Yeah. But some things I'm not just sorry for. I'm very sorry for. But anyway, they separated themselves, they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Do that one too. They stood upon, that's what Daniel did. When Daniel prayed, if you remember, if you go back and study Daniel, that time that he was praying, he was praying for his whole nation, and he was praying and apologizing and repenting to God for sins that he didn't even commit. He was repenting for sins that were done by his forefathers. What do we see Job doing in Job chapter 1? Huh? He said, maybe my kids sin. I'm going to offer up a sacrifice for them. Do you think God just might honor that? If you could offer up something of yours to God for the sake of your children to be saved? Wouldn't you do it? That's what parents do. When you become a parent, that's a life of giving. It is a life of sacrifice. And that doesn't end when the kids grow up and they get out on their own. In fact, sometimes that's when you got to pray more. Okay? So, yeah. Confess the sins of loved ones and ask God to forgive them. What did Jesus do on the cross about the people crucifying him? 
Father, forgive them. What did Stephen do when they were stoning him to the people that were stoning him? Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Same thing. Verse 3, and they stood up in their place, read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, one-fourth part of the day. You fast and pray, take your Bible with you. Make sure you have your Bible. Um, I would say be old-fashioned about it. Get this Bible and not this Bible. Okay? Maybe a notebook. Something for you to write things down. Things to pray. Say, what do I pray about all day? I don't know. You can start writing stuff down now. In fact, I got a starter kit right here for you. Okay? Wouldn't it be great for somebody to come up to you in heaven and say, um, you don't know me, but I know that my name was on that Bethel prayer list and God has told me that you prayed for me that day and you have no idea how God blessed my life after that. Okay? I am in awe a lot over the number of people that have told me personally, Pastor, we pray for you and your wife every single day. We pray for your church every single day. We, we never not pray for your church and your family. That blesses me. But they read in the law of the Lord. They read the book for part of the day. Bible reading, prayer is you talking to God. Bible reading is God talking to you back. Okay, and maybe God may not be ready to answer a specific thing with you that day. So don't plan on doing one of these. Well, is that the answer to my prayer? I don't know. Okay, um, but God may start you on something that day and then eight to ten months or a year later, later bring you to that and show you what he's doing from the word of God, okay? But that's what they did. Bring a Bible with you. They, they read the book of the law, their God, one-fourth part of the day, another part they confessed. And then, this is how you could end the day. Spend the rest of the day worshiping. Well, how do you do that? Just tell God you love him. Make, make a list of things that you don't want to lose and start thanking God for the things that you have that you don't want to lose. My wife reminded me today that a year ago today she got the worst of all phone calls. It was when the doctor told her she had cancer. Okay? Now, I've been telling God thank you all day that I still have my wife. Okay? So you have more to be thankful for than you have a day's worth of time to pray for it. But worship God. Tell Him thank you. Give Him praise. Sing if you want to. And since there's nobody around, you don't care how it sounds. Okay? And I mean that. Sing unto the Lord. Sing His praises. Sing His songs. I, I personally sing because I love singing the Lord's song. I like making the Lord's music. I, that gives me great joy and satisfaction. I, I like the fact that some of you like it. That makes me feel good. But I'm to the point in my life now to where if you don't like it, I, that's okay. Not everybody likes my singing. Not everybody likes the music I like. I want it to be for your blessing, but I want it to be for God. And you don't have to be able to carry a tune in a bucket to sing the way angels sing. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, okay? Make it loud. But that's what they did. That's a good model. See here what the Bible's doing very subtly? It's not writing down, thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that. What the Bible's doing is telling you how God moved in his people in the days of Nehemiah 
and how it was just all of them, all of a sudden, just felt like this is the thing to do. We're going to read in the book of the law for a fourth. So a fourth of the day. So what, 12 hours of the day? So how many hours is that? Three hours? And you complain that I'm going over 45 minutes? They read the Bible for three hours. Three hours. Somebody sat and proclaimed the word of the Lord. And it didn't bother them a bit in the world because most of those people had never heard it. And you know what I bet they were doing? Give us more. Give us more. Tell us more of this, the law that God gave to Moses. Tell us what he said, okay? Didn't bother them a bit in the world, amen? And it won't bother you either if you separate. No TV, no radio, no phone, no grandkids, nothing. No work, no shopping, no extracurricular activities. Pray and fast, make it those two things for that day. Okay? Make it those two things for that day. Uh, we'll get, well, I won't get into this tonight, uh, but we'll look at what the scripture says. It is not always a 100% guarantee. Let's say there's something you really think you need God to do in your life, or you want God to do in your life, okay? Um, quick story, a guy years ago beat me out of quite a bit of money. He charged a, uh, a charge account that I had at a paint store and promised he was going to use the material to do this job, and when he got paid, he would pay me back, so I let him do it. And um, I was scared to death that he was going to beat me out of it, so I spent a day praying over that. I don't remember if I fasted, so I won't say that I did, but, but I spent a day praying about that. And I was, I was worried, because my wife said, you shouldn't have done that, you know that guy. Well, I got a soft heart for him. Well, it's your heart, then it's going to be your wallet. You're going to figure out how to pay it. If he don't pay it, I'm not paying it for you. And God was using her, okay? Well, the guy didn't pay it. And I had to sell off some stuff that I had bought, you know, to do paint jobs and things like that. I had to sell it almost for nothing just to get up enough money to pay that bill. And after praying all day and crying all day about it, God opened the scriptures to me in the book of Psalms. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. And I went, God, that's not, that's not funny. That's, but that is exactly, that is exactly. And see, the greater thing that God was doing with me was not showing me that if I just pray enough, God will do what I want him to do. God was going to teach me a grown-up lesson. And it was a hard lesson but it was a grown-up lesson that I needed to learn. And you know that deadbeat? His mom went to church with my mom. So I go visit my mom's church one day, and his mom came up to me and chewed me out. How come you cheated my son? And I'm going, ma'am, I don't want to get into it. That's your son, and I'm not going to say a word. I turned around and walked off. But that's how he treated me, Okay. And I had worked for a long time trying to lead that man to the Lord. But anyway, so it's not always guaranteed that you're going to get what you want. Okay? So don't think that way. Well, I fasted and prayed. How come God's not doing something? God's going to do th a lot of things that in the long run will make you a much better person. Okay? Okay?